So I'm sure you've seen the program. We have in our panel, Dr. Danashri Yaharam, uh, who's an assistant professor with the Manipal Academy of Higher Education. We've got Dr. Florian Krumper, who's a senior researcher and who's the director of the Climate Change and Risk Program at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. We've got Dr. Saurabh Thakur, who's an associate fellow at the National Maritime Foundation in New Delhi, and Dr. Sibel Kiros, who's with the Global Resilience Partnership and the Stockholm Resilience Center. And uh, we thought of doing a bit of a, not the kind of uh, panel where each panelist is going to make, uh, you know, 10 minutes introductory remarks or something, but we'll have more of a uh, a panel where I'm going to ask each of them a couple of questions to get the conversation going. And then based on that, we'll, we'll, we'll integrate you and also the questions you post or would like to ask later. So perhaps I'll start with, with uh, Dana Shri. Um, so Dana Shri, it will be interesting to, to hear from you how you understand this interlinkage between climate change peace and security and conflict. And um, in that context, if you find that the different academic disciplines that's involved have different perceptions around what these issues are, what the interlinkage is, how they are and how they are related and how to make sense of it. So um, yeah, it'll be great to, to hear your views on that, Danashri. Thank you, Cedric, uh, for that question. So uh, I think when we look at uh, uh, the linkages, interlinkages between climate change, conflict, peace, security, uh, I think we need to start with where we were and where we are now. So the research in this field has significantly moved uh, in a direction which is more holistic. So you know, at one point in time, uh, uh, you know, this research was largely sort of. Uh, driven by security studies and uh, linearity, which was associated with how climate change leads to conflict. Uh, this has moved to more correlational linkages, to more of understanding of how we need to look at it from a systemic perspective, how we need to look at uh, network analysis, because there are so many actors and so many issues involved while we talk about climate change and conflict nexus. Uh, so in that sense, this research has moved and also uh, uh, because of the influence of various disciplines, uh, I think where we are right now, there is a cross-disciplinary exchange on this issue as well. Uh, now, uh, I, you know, if you're going to bring in practice, policy and research, as the topic suggests, I think there are a lot of challenges, of course, uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the linkage, we can, we can probably... I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, there was some kind of a disturbance. Yeah. Just let me just remind everyone to please uh, put your microphones on mute uh, so that we make sure there's no background noise. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Danashri. Uh, so you know uh, we can we can definitely analyze climate change and conflict. Uh, uh, you know by looking at the scalar analysis, like global uh, to regional to national to subnational. You know that is one way of looking at things because climate change is a transnational issue which deals with security concerns at multiple levels. It need not be just at the subnational level as we are looking at it because we are looking at you know, issues which are transboundary in nature. The other ways of you know, perceptions around environment and security itself, right? So security can be looked at from the perspective of human, national, uh, to a comprehensive, to traditional, to non-traditional. So there are a whole lot of researchers who are looking at these issues from different angles of security itself, which leads to different findings. And then uh, we look at conflict. There are different perceptions of conflict, right? So we can talk about direct and uh, uh, violent conflict, but at the same time, we also need to look at how climate change uh, constantly interacts with structural uh, conflict as well, because that is something which is very important for countries in the global South in particular. We need not look at it just from the perspective of just violent conflict. Um, and then we also have, have to look at like the perceptions of environment, right? So are we looking at it from an ecological perspective or socio-ecological perspective? Uh, or are we also bringing in the economic perspective, which is broad-based understanding of economy and not just the neoliberal sort of understanding of economy? So in that sense, all these different understandings are uh, being built upon by cross-disciplinary research. But if you're going to bring in the policy part, like you mentioned, there are differing perspectives, say, if there is a Ministry of Defense and Ministry of uh, 
uh, uh, environment and ministry of uh, water and ministry of agriculture and food all these different ministries generally most of the countries tend to work in silos and there's much less coordination that happens between them so how does research actually translates into policy is something that is still not being worked upon from a systemic perspective so i think the research has moved or is currently moving in the right direction but when it comes to this uh, research policy interface i feel there is still a lot of gap that needs to be bridged thank you so much you know i i think uh, you spot on and that's, that's certainly our uh, i would say experience as well and and i feel that when it comes down to specific situations so for instance when we if you engage with somalia or or south sudan or uh, iraq or colombia that creates opportunities where you are responding to a specific situation where different ministries realize they have to for instance engage with each other because they both have an uh, interest and in, and in, in, in overarching mandates for instance for for that particular situation and also where where research from different disciplines then come together so i think that's that's very interesting and do you find or have you found Nanash the also um different narratives tensions between a global north global south approaches to this topic uh, yes, so from my experience, uh, I find that there is this narrative around climate conflict security is still sort of dominated by the West. So that does have an effect on how it is being, say, uh, contextualized in the global South setting. It has changed a lot, but still these perceptions, I mean, I'm, I'm from uh, India and South Asia, where there is still reluctance to, for instance, associate climate change with security. Uh, the way the West uh, or, you know, the way, say, the global North countries uh, look at these interconnections, right? So uh, even, uh, you know, when it comes to climate security, there is that deep uh, sort of interlinkages that these countries have with developmental concerns as well, which may not really apply in the case of the global North countries. So we cannot think of climate security and conflict without also putting in the development imperatives, which are so important uh, to be integrated into the discourse. Uh, also, because you know we are talking about largely socio-environmentalism in the global south, so most of these countries have always spoken about environment from that perspective. So even climate change is largely the discourses around climate change are largely influenced by these ideas around socio-environmentalism, uh, which of course includes issues of development, poverty, livelihoods. So therefore, these concerns have all you know always sort of been prioritized in the discourse. So you know, so even when we talk about climate security, uh, you know, these although it's not directly uh, uh, acknowledged in the policy circles, but you can see indirectly these issues are acknowledged in various ways through developmental challenges like impacts of climate change on food, water, livelihoods, uh, disaster-related concerns, and all these issues. So there are these interconnections, but when it comes to conflict per se, there is still sort of, uh, I mean, one of the one of the statements made by the Indian representative to the UNS, uh, UN uh, at the UNSC was that the linkages between climate and conflict are still contested. That was one of the statements. Uh, now, of course, you know, when we uh, when we have to study these linkages, it may be difficult to quantify everything qualitatively representing all the views and interests may be also difficult to see what uh, is say like in the case of migration what is causing that migration uh, it, it is kind of difficult to show that and especially like you take the example of south asia where there is a lot of mobility happening in all directions there's rural to urban migration coastal to interior areas you also have cross-border migration happening now how much of it can be attributed to climate change? How much of it can be attributed to say other issues, which you know, which actually tend to get highlighted uh, other than you know climate change? Climate change is never really highlighted in those in those stories, uh, which needs to be addressed. So I think the research in the global south, in many contexts, still hasn't moved in in that direction where we can think of these issues as more systemic and interlinked with each other rather than you know, just looking at it as a livelihood issue or economic issue. So I think in that sense, uh, we are a little behind in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in the global south, how we can think of these issues uh, in, a, in a way that is more contextualized in the global south. Uh, that, that is something that is uh, important. Uh, I, I also want to um, add uh, uh, 
you know, I also want to add that policy making uh, in the global south also sort of depends on these perceptions around, you know, sovereignty, territoriality. So, uh, I mean, you know, I'm again going uh, to the example of South Asia itself, where a lot of uh, border disputes still exist. And of course, you in the same area, you have a lot of climate fragilities, you have, uh, you know, security risks, which are also linked with climate change. Uh, but then these issues don't get highlighted because you still have unresolved uh, geopolitical and other uh, issues. So then how do we make sure that climate change is added uh, to those to those risks? So, uh, you know, this prioritization is something that is always uh, very important to contextualize in the case of Global South, considering uh, issues of development as well as, uh, you know, uh, the territorial integrity part, which is which is very important in context like South Asia. Thank, thank you so much, Dinashri. No, and I think also the the expectation that there is some kind of a direct linkage between climate and conflict is, is perhaps also, I think, often oversimplified. Obviously, conflict relates to how people choose to respond to certain conditions, and there will always be very many factors involved. So, uh, you know, climate can have or climate related weather events like flooding or droughts can can uh, can create conditions where people consider whether they should move or how they should adapt their livelihoods but those are always human choices and those will be influenced by very many different factors and so i think that's that's something that we we need to develop further in our understanding and and that's of, of course again where the insights from many different disciplines are so important but let me turn to florian because at cipri they have specifically done research on these interlinkages uh, through uh, looking at a number of pathways. And I wonder if you can explain to us a little bit more, Florian, uh, what your thinking is around these pathways and, and what your research in this area, have, have uh, what insights you've gained so far from this pathways approach. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And I, I think that that neatly neatly builds on, on uh, Danashri's first uh, intervention here. Um, which, which I, I completely agree. We have we have made tremendous strides in in the research here. We have diversified it and and um, have come to an actually much better understanding of of how these dynamics turn out. With even those that were questioning these links in the in the past coming around and having to acknowledge that that okay, there is something going on here. Um, that said, I think. Uh, uh, the way we use pathways is essentially building on research to it, looking at the academic literature and and looking at it from a not academic lens but trying to put a put a policy lens on it and I try to like link that now also in light what what you just said on the simplification but without oversimplifying it right but what we're trying to do with pathways is simplifying the complexity that we see out there climate change impact on society and how that translate into security is really complicated it's, there's a lot of things going on context matters you know what you see in one case is not the same in another case we see the same impact in one having completely different outcomes um how do we navigate that um and i think pathways here are a way to simplify this way of thinking give us a structure to think about it which maintains accuracy it's not simplifying it to the to the way you know climate change causes conflict, um, but it is 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 simplifying it while while maintaining accuracy, but also by being useful to a policymaker and then to a policy audience to apply that, understand that, um, and deal with that. So um, what we see in in looking at this research is essentially that we 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 see a very clear um, connection that that climate change increases the risk of um, human insecurity, specifically also the, the risk of violence and conflict and across the full spectrum. I think that's also what Danashri pointed out in some of the reviews that we did uh, looking at South Asia, for instance, you see that, that some of the conflict dynamics um, are very different, right? It's, it's more playing out, some of these grievances are playing out more in, in protests and, and rioting, while in other cases like Somalia, we see them influencing um, more and more civil war and, and that type of, of, of dynamics and, and insurgencies. So I think that is that is important to keep in mind. That's why a human security lens and a broad security framing is really important to navigate this. So the pathways that we, we um, identified, and actually let me put them in the, 
in the chat so you can um, so I don't have a PowerPoint presentation here, but I actually you can see them. Um, so we have four pathways identified. The first one is deterioration of livelihood conditions, um, where we clearly see that that um, climate impacts are affecting people's vulnerability, people's livelihood. Um, and that uh, are contributing to grievances, which which leads to different responses, which include, um, on the one hand, as I said, mass protests, um, but also feed into into um, communal violence, resource competition, and dynamics like that. Um, the second one uh, is migration and mobility. Here, on the one hand, uh, you mentioned the complexity of really identifying what, why people leave, uh, when do they leave. But uh, obviously, in, in terms of forced displacements for flooding, we, 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 it's, a, it's a little bit more obvious. And we see that specifically in Somalia, um, a lot of the, the urbanization drive is driven by, by forced displacement because of flooding in recent years um, that have become more frequent, um, which creates challenges and lack of economic opportunities in, in urban areas, which then again feeds into, on the one hand, uh, illicit activities and increase in crime, people trying to make a livelihood, um, linking it to charcoal trades and, and things like that, but also provides an opportunity, for instance, for, for recruitment efforts um, in multiple ways. Um, mobility here refers more to, to the dynamics of herd of farmers, um, where, where herders are pushed uh, in, into different areas, which is an important factor. Also, what we see in the research, um, the risks, the security implications don't necessarily play out in the place where the climate impact is, right? So if, if, you're, if, if your area is affected by climate change and, and your herds um, don't have the ability to graze in that land, you're moving into a different area. So we see in a lot of cases actually um, that the neighboring regions are actually affected by the insecurities, right? Um, so that is sort of uh, important to also keep in mind. Um, armed group tactics is the third pathway that we find. It's, it's really interesting to see, uh, on the one hand, very direct links on operational readiness, um, or, or the op operational ability of, of armed actors um, is, is affected by climate change, for instance, navigating through, through heavy mud because of flooding, etc., and how different groups are actually um, differently able to operate in this space. But also, as I mentioned here, the, the, the question of recruitment. Um, you see in different contexts, armed groups responding different. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, through, through being affected themselves, for instance, through natural disasters are driving, uh, being forced to re-recruit because their troops were impacted, being able to interact differently with the, the local communities through, through because their, their food supply was impacted, for instance, et cetera. So it's very interesting, different pathways. Um, and the last one is elite exploitation and resource mismanagement. Um, where we see elites jumping into these spaces, uh, 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 take, taking land uh, from, from people that are, were displaced, for instance, uh, or weren't able to, to, to use the land in the year because of climate impacts and, and because of the existing land tenure rights, you're, you're losing access and elites are, are simply taking back the land, uh, which in turn shows you the interrelation is, of course, deteriorating livelihoods of people Again, so these pathways are, are no causal mechanisms, but are, are ways of structuring our thinking. You're muted, Cedric. Thank you. Um, we spoke now about how these pathways uh, maybe help us to think about and understand uh, some of these interlinkages between climate change and environmental crisis and, and, and conflicts. But can they also be uh, a basis for designing peace building interventions or opportunities for, for you know, using uh, this climate security tensions to, to build social cohesion and, and to build a positive peace? Okay, that's two questions, right? In, in itself. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, on, on the one hand, I think, yes, it's a tool of structuring our thinking and helping us navigate this complexity. And that works as we see from, from our experience, both with, with policy makers or, or um, um, on a higher decision le making level, for instance, the work we're doing with new Security Council providing evidence based along these pathways, um, uh, which is helpful. But we also see that in, in um, context where people are working on implementation and trying to navigate that, for instance, in peace operations, 
um, um, but also other, other, other types of interventions where we see that, that it provides a way to connecting the dots. One of the key answers we are typically getting is, I don't do climate security, I work on protection of civilians, um, right? But then you're like, okay, tell me about protection of civilians. What, what are the sort of the, the issues you see? It was like, well, we see a seasonal trend in, in violence against civilians, which typically has to do with employment in the agricultural sector, right? And then if you ask two questions more, you're like, well, it all has to do when the rain season comes. And if climate impacts are um, impacting when the rain season comes, you know, you, 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 we don't need a complicated forecasting system. We need just those people that are already doing and are already experts in the field to understand the connection. It's, you know, it's not a rocket science in that much, it's meteorology. It's, it's understanding that the rain season in Mali in this area will come two months late this year or will be much weaker. It, you know, it will be weaker or it will be stronger. We actually don't need much more information. And if I'm a protection of civilians officer and I know the rain season is coming late and I know there is a link with violence because of the employment, I can act preemptively, right? I can bring resources into the right place. And I think pathways are one way of just allowing us in a way, as I said, hopefully accurately, but also usefully simplify these connections in a way that, that allows policymakers not to become a climate security expert because they shouldn't, but to, to try to navigate this field. Thank you so much, Florian. Let me turn to, to Saurabh. Uh, Saurabh, you, you, I think, come from a geography and international relations background. So it'll be interesting to, to and then also I think you, you have a background in history, and it will be interesting to hear from you a little bit more about the history and current state of, of climate politics and thinking in India. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I want to sort of uh, take it forward from where Dhanushree and Florian uh, left it. I mean, uh, the framing of the problem of climate security in India is largely, as Dhanushree said, social and environmental. So once you start looking at the present set of climate policies and the thinking behind them, you really have to dig deeper and go slightly back in past to understand where, why is it that there is a certain framing of this problem? Where is it emerging from? And the India is a sort of a land of contradictions and very, a lot of, uh, when you look at it geographically, it's a very complex country. So we are facing different sets of challenges, and this has been through, uh, through throughout history. Uh, so at, at the present moment, uh, when it comes to the United Nations uh, Security Council, India may talk about uh, being careful about linking climate and security. But if you look at the past uh, 100 to 200, or even for, uh, further back in history, uh, climate security is very much part of the narrative. Uh, and you see how the history evolved in the, during this period and how understanding of climate and weather emerges. Uh, you see how security and climate are int intricately linked. Uh, and that is sort of reflected later on when once the uh, UN triple, uh, UNFCCC negotiation starts and India takes a certain position uh, using a certain framing of historical responsibility, carbon colonialism, uh, carbon budget approaches, uh, and common but differentiated responsibilities. So all of them, if you start looking at it, where it is exactly rooted? Uh, so one common factor that emerges is, uh, of course, colonialism. And uh, that seems to be the predominant approach uh, or the framing that seem, uh, that's shaping up how these uh, different keywords or these this different framings are emerging from. And a couple of things that uh, I would like to sort of highlight and in this uh, intervention is that water seems to be one common factor across India, that water security seems to be one issue that is uh, truly the biggest challenge currently and was the challenge even 100 years ago or 200 years ago. So water control was a major, hydraulic security was a major, major part of the British colonial policies in India. Uh, the whole building of canal cities in northwest of uh, India, which was undivided Punjab uh, or reclaiming of land in Bombay, uh, modern day Mumbai. So all, all of these uh, so uh, massive engineered landscapes uh, were created during these 100 to 200 year periods, uh, which uh, sort of played with two different uh, framings at that time and that have continued to sort of linger in the policy as well. So Indian policymakers at that point in time and at today are dealing with both the Malthusian fears that of scarcity, 
and at the same time they also carry forward this promise that we can overcome this dependence on climate india still broadly a rain uh, repen, uh, indian agriculture sector is broadly rain dependent and uh, if you see the kind of language that was employed by the british colonial uh, uh, pol uh, policy makers 100 years ago uh, almost some sort of similarity you will see throughout that period even in the post independent india and one of the things uh, that you'll see in the post independent india and the, the continuation that you see in the policies on two fronts one is this obsession of engineering and overcoming the climate uh, dependence on climate so a post independent india starts investing more and more in massive dam building it's uh, uh, it starts investing uh, massively uh, and it's uh, in flood control uh, in many parts of the country uh, in the towards the south of the country fishery sectors becomes the mainstay of uh, livelihoods uh, and food security uh, so massive investments were made in building infrastructures uh, dealing with these issues uh, at the same time uh, scarcity remained a constant concern through these uh, through this period so probably if you take one seminal example in the his, this uh, probably uh, is the his, uh, the the bengal famine of 1943 uh, which really brought back the Malthusian fears, which were starting to go away with the building of the canal cities and some sort of water security emerging uh, in the north, at least, uh, of India. But eventually, post-independent India starts uh, once again dealing with these two separate uh, scarcity, as well as this promise of plentitude. Uh, and then towards 1970s, as environmental movements begin to take uh, center stage and the, climate, clim the question of climate change starts to emerge, uh, India brings up uh, uh, the question of poverty, and it, India brings up the question of what Dhanushree talked about, right to development. So, uh, very famously at Stockholm, um, uh, former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi talked about how poverty is the greatest polluter in the world, and we are not responsible. Uh, the, we, as in the third world uh, or the developing world, is not responsible for this problem. Now, this this line of argument then translates at UNFCCC as well, where equity and CBDR become the center stage of how India looks at the problem of climate change. Now, once again, uh, India focuses on the questions of adaptation. Uh, it uh, did not in initial, especially during the Kyoto period, did not want to take up mitigation responsibilities and wanted to sort of talk more about historical responsibilities. So around 2009, when the Copenhagen talks failed, uh, you see another shift in India, which was some would say short lived, but it has had a bit of a dent in how India now thinks of climate change. Uh, and in that period of the past 10 years, you see India emerging out of that uh, idea that we have to now do something about climate change because our, there is, of course, international pressure to do something about it. And domestically, there is a lot of concerns emerging uh, as well. So post 2009 that you see India in these negotiations start uh, do talk, uh, dilute their position slightly on the CBDR, and then that leads to the emergence of the Paris Agreement where the annex-based differentiations go out, and India accepts that, which was not possible if, uh, if, if you would have asked anybody 10 years before that. So post-Paris, you see India now investing massively once again in adaptation measures, uh, renewable energy, but the question of mitigation still uh, broadly is framed in this uh, idea of common but differentiated responsibilities uh, and equity and the principle of equity uh, and that played out at cop 26 as well so uh, i feel like that that gives you a broader picture of where i want to sort of place climate security debate uh, at, at this point in this thank you thank you very much and i i think that really also you know shows us the broader picture uh, within which we have to situate uh, our understanding of the interlinkages between between climate and security both domestically or in the region and and internationally and so i wanted to ask you that because at the un security council and then i guess other four years as well india is quite skeptical about making the the formal link between climate and conflict uh, but at the same time i think in in the indian subcontinent and in the context of for example the, the indus river basin and the relations between Hello. india and pakistan and Afghanistan. Oh, can you hear me now yeah yeah no but Yesterday, Sorry. I did not succeed. I'm Sorry, General Barilaya, if you can just mute. Thank you. Uh, so I was saying, Sarob, that um, so in the context of, I guess, the relations between Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, etc., I think concerns are expressed about perceptions around resource scarcity, especially around the Indus River Basin in these countries. 
Um, so to, to that degree, in terms of interstate conflict and tensions, there seems to be a recognition also of the, the climate and environmental dimension to that. Um, so can you give us some insights into India's thinking both internationally and regionally on, on climate and security? Yeah, so I think the India's position, especially at the UNSC, uh, in my view, is more of a political uh, decision. Uh, it does not reflect the on-ground situation or the on-ground realities. Uh, I think once you start breaking down, as I began by saying that there, it's a complex, uh, the, India's climate security challenge is quite complex. So if you you mentioned the Indus Water Treaty and uh, the Tibetan, the great Tibetan watershed where the rivers are being, so India is, uh, or the South Asian region in general is uh, basically a geopolitical quagmire. But at the same time, uh, its uh, resources are a common pool resources. We are sharing our rivers, we are sharing our fish stocks. Uh, and so in that sense, the de futures, uh, future of the, all these countries in South Asia are, are interlinked on this question of climate change. Where, uh, as you know, and the challenge in each of these regions are different. Uh, in the north, where it comes to when it comes to sh uh, river uh, river sharing, uh, transboundary river disputes, are uh, people have talked about how rivers, particularly Indus and Brahmaputra, can become, and even Ganga for that matter, can become critical tools in the hands of uh, uh, who, someone who would look at uh, someone who would uh, sort of look at hawk, uh, this entire issue very hawkishly. Uh, for others, it's also an issue of human security, uh, and India, being a middle riparian state, uh, uh, has a complex challenge ahead of it. So, in this water treaty, particularly, was a pretty generous treaty, uh, and it has survived over time. But from time and again, as the conflict and the ge general geopolitical uh, conflict sort of emerges in India, you start hearing voices about how Indus can also become, or the Indus water can become the tool uh, in dealing with these geopolitical tensions. So that's one challenge in the north of the country. Uh, we all also faced, uh, Indian policymakers have been talking about how the diversion of water in Brahmaputra in the northeast uh, by China, uh, that's a constant, uh, uh, yet another cha transboundary challenge that India is faced with at this point. Uh, India's relations with its other neighbors, uh, including Bangladesh, for the longest time was stuck on this question of water sharing. And that has only in recent years as some amount of progress has been made on it, but broadly uh, as impact of climate change if, uh, and the projections as they go at this moment, uh, that's likely to emerge back again. Within the country as well, uh, you see uh, at the center of the country, uh, the, especially the coal mining districts of India, uh, India has been struggling to deal with Maoist insurgency now for decades. Uh, and here, and also uh, the rights uh, in this uh, in this part of the country, it's not just Maoist insurgency, but it's also then climate security becomes a question of human rights, property rights, uh, forest rights. Uh, in the south of the country, where the fisheries are again a common pool resources, uh, we have transboundary conflicts with Sri Lanka, uh, and at the same time, there is also internally we have endogamous uh, sort of conflicts within communities. We have conflicts uh, between small scale fishers and large scale fishers. So their uh, technology becomes a variable in the whole uh, debate on climate security. Uh, and uh, therefore, so the challenge really and the different kind of variables that we have to deal with, how we're going to look at climate security in India are very different in different parts of the country. As far as uh, India's position at the UNSC is concerned, I feel like one, I think Dhanashree also pointed out to the statement uh, that it's a contested link. That's what India argues. Uh, but you could also argue that India feels more comfortable that the climate security issue or the climate change issue largely broadly should remain within the UNFCCC uh, because it's a more representative body. Uh, it is a body where uh, India and other many other third world countries uh, feel more comfortable because they have a greater voice in it. UNSC is still seen as an exclusive club uh, where India has been trying to get in for a, quite some time as well. But at the same time, that exclusivity sort of makes it uh, slightly problematic. Another, uh, as I already mentioned, history and how the narrative is built on climate security in India uh, is also a big restraint. Uh, sovereignty. Now, for countries, mostly post-colonial states, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole concept of sovereignty is sacrosanct. In fact, the whole idea of uh, uh, principal uh, sovereignty over natural resources, which is acknowledged by the UN. Uh, that was the centerpiece in the 1950s and the 60s as the states began to decolonize. Uh, and that has remained so. So the biggest fear for a country like India then remains is that states can actually employ UNSC sanctions uh, 
uh, through resolutions. And uh, we have seen examples of that uh, where hard shell of sovereignty, as they say, is not so hard uh, at the end of the day. Uh, our experiences with R2P uh, in many parts of the country, uh, many parts of the world, uh, are also another uh, key indicator of why India doesn't want to link these two. Uh, going by some of the policy uh, makers that I have interacted with, there is also this idea of uh, climate security is broadly seen as a domestic policy. Uh, policy. It's a matter of domestic policy. The moment you make it uh, a new security issue at an international level, then you're dealing with uh, uh, questions of pro neo-protectionism. India has been um, struggling with bans uh, and India has been uh, fighting in WTO as well for the longest time against uh, processes uh, and process, me process methods, uh, regulations and bans that have been talked about at the WTO. So all these factors, I feel like, contribute to why uh, uh, India is reluctant in linking these two. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. And, and also in the the interlinkages or, or, or the the different scales, you know, local, regional, global, where where this issue plays out. And um, I want to go to to Sibel next because Sibel is working on a, a on a very interesting project where they're looking at seeds of resilience. Uh, she's at the Stockholm Resilience Center, and so I would like Sibel to tell us a little bit about that because there's all this also this element where some of these conflicts and you mentioned Saurabh in the context of the Indus River where the conflicts can also be an opportunity for peace and for peace building and for cooperation if we for instance focus on how to manage those joint resources together um, so that's why I want to turn to Sibel and hear some of the uh, some insights from the research you are doing on, on seeds for resilience Sibel. Yes, thank you, Selik, and thank you for all the other panelists for such interesting reflections. Um, so I guess that I will just very briefly start to give the sort of uh, context for this project. Um, the project comes from the recognition that, as you very well said, like we are entering in this quite um, uncertain area that we scientists call the Anthropocene and with increasing amount of risks um, uh, and sort of also like the intensity of those risks or drivers of change, it, it's it's becoming um, higher and higher. So like both like environmental change, but also like um, other sort of social, um, social economical drivers and such as conflict like that, we also know that has been increasing and, and is expected to continue to increase within the next decades. And so with, within this context it gets like uh, for us um, very easy to fall into this kind of more dystopic uh, ideas of uh, the future so like very negative ideas of the future so this project comes um, a bit from uh, this recognition that um, we need to envision positive futures if we are up to know where we want to go and how do we want to go there so which kind of factories we need to build um, and so, um, and so from there comes the recognition that we need to sort of um, get inspiration. So like look into positive examples of how those futures can look like and what type of initiatives can contribute to take us there. So this is the idea of um, what we call a seed. So it's like you, you, you plant a seed, you plant a small thing that can grow and become that future or become sort of, um, the things that you want to have and that you and that you value, and so in this project, we um, I can place it here in the chat because this project is kind of a su a sub project of this bigger network that is called the Seeds of the Good Anthropocene, and in this particular project, we wanted to look into sort of initiatives that are very local or that it can be like that they are community led and really like bottom up, uh, coming from the bottom up or or also like led by sort of um, institutions that are um, applying it at the local level at least. But these are sort of initiatives with a very local focus and that are sort of working uh, towards building resilience in communities that are affected by conflict um, and trying to contribute to transformative change towards peace building um, also many times with the recognition that, that uh, in order to achieve peace, we have to have present this very like sort of social, ecological, 
psychological perspective that uh, that many times a lot of these conflicts are attached to um, problems with the natural resources management and so you know that is the problem and probably also the solution so sort of it can also be like a leverage point um, for uh, um, for achieving peace and so um, what we are doing is that we are sort of um, collecting together with sort of um, so we are doing a lot of transdisciplinary um, research collaborations and together with partners that are working in the field with these initiatives these are like different NGOs or sort of community leaders um, we are sort of looking into these initiatives and kind of bridging uh, from theory and then sort of with several interactions with practical uh, building on practical examples as well uh, bridging sort of uh, the fields of uh, um, resilience thinking with sort of peace and conflict field uh, and trying to understand what are the things that these initiatives are promoting that might be important for building local resilience and sort of resilience to the drivers of conflict and potentially transforming those situations so sort of having a um, significant uh, transformative impact. And then the next step is that, so if we are doing something that is transformative at the local level, can these things scale up and take into sort of broader systemic uh, changes? So it is pretty much applying a very uh, systems thinking frame on these local initiatives that are working uh, towards peace building. And it's being uh, um, very, very interesting. Like this is an ongoing project and we are sort of, we are still like collecting and expanding the database and, and analyzing, um, comparing these different local initiatives and these different studies. And I guess that some of the things that start to come up and these are still a bit preliminary, but like, um, is that, there are uh, things that sort of contribute in general for resilience and for sort of transformative change. So it's also important to say that in this project, we are using resilience a little bit as transformative capacity. So not just the capacity to sort of bounce back or, um, or even just adapt, but more sort of resilience in this, um, uh, in this sort of transformations uh, framing. So sort of the capacity to, um, transform something that is going in the wrong direction. And um, of course that we identified, we did, uh, we see like emergent things from all cases that are pretty common. So like sort of the importance of like access to, to knowledge and increased awareness like within the communities. So sort of with that access to knowledge, increased awareness, it comes also sort of in, um, that has an impact in agency, both individual agency, but also like at the community level. Um, and we also see like, uh, of course, the importance of having resources available. So sort of some flexibility or the ability of connecting to other communities and learn from them or get help from them. And very important also the ability of connecting to networks at the decision-making scale. So that makes all the difference also for the success of these initiatives or not. Uh, but then another very important learning is, of course, that, you know, how much of this and in each way these factors or other factors uh, are important. Uh, it's extremely complex specific, as Florian was <laughs> mentioning. So like every case, despite that there are some general things that we can see, you know, that come from all these initiatives, like every case is in its way, of course, unique. And there are factors that only matter in certain contexts. And then there's also like... Um, I guess that all these factors have different weight depending on the context as well. Um, and then another interesting thing that I just wanted to talk, um, to say here, because I guess it's, it brings a little bit of a different perspective, but I think that all of you working, I'm not a, a peace and conflict scholar, but I guess that all of you working with, with the peace and conflict probably know very well about this, but it's, it's something that we see, um, you know, um, that we resilient scholars also see very much in the transformations towards sustainability. So not only like towards peace, but it is, and it's something that is coming out very sort of um, clearly in our findings is this sort of the importance, like transforming towards uh, peace or towards sustainability or, uh, or 
Um, it's not like baking a cake. So it's not like you have this and that and that. And if we promote this and that and that, then we have our cake and we do our recipe. So it's a much more complex problem. It's more like raising a child, you know, you never know how, how it's going to end, even if you do everything right. And one thing that we are really seeing in the results is this importance of these intangible things. It's like sometimes you don't have all these things in place, but you have someone that has a call. You have an extremely engaged leader, for instance, a community leader. And that might be an ingredient that is enough so there are a lot of things that are very difficult to capture or measure or something that we call even like the willingness to change. It's something, what is that, right? But without that, you actually don't have that transformative process. And when does that willingness to change, you know, passes from just my individual level to this more community collective level, you know, what is needed <laughs> to make that step? These are really sort of, these are actually the most important questions. They are very difficult. Um, to sort of capture, you know, in uh, in uh, um, by our approaches or methods, but we need to definitely get better into sort of capture those soft elements also that can lead to sort of positive transformative um, change. Um, so yeah, Cedric, maybe I, I stop there because I don't want to talk too much. Uh, thank you very much, Sibel. <laughs> it was. Uh... I think a very nice place to kind of wrap up our, our panel part of our discussion on, on a positive note on about looking forward, about looking at about how can we, you know, take the knowledge that we have and that is developing collectively as, as, we, as we engage with this field, how we can take uh, this knowledge about the linkages between climate and security at all these different levels and look and, and use it to also engage and contribute to transformation. And so I think in that sense, this, this seeds approach is, is very interesting. And I really also appreciate uh, your kind of reflection towards the end that, you know, I, I think we, we tend to, to come to transformations and engagements with, with conflict very much with a preconceived idea of a recipe, as opposed to what you're laying out now in terms of working with what you've got in a particular context around that and, and using the resilience that is there and strengthening that up, I think is a very interesting approach as well. So thank you very much for that. So I, I would like to, to invite now uh, our participants, if you have any questions you would like to pose to the panel, or if you would like to make a contribution yourself uh, to, to the discussion that we've had so far, you are most welcome. You can uh, please raise your hand under the reactions uh, icon at the bottom you'll see there's an option to raise your hand or you can also post in the chat so please uh, feel free to to uh, to engage and and i will recognize you if you raise your hand and then um you can put your video on if you want and and, and ask your question or engage with with the panel and with the rest of the colleagues so the floor is open and anyone is welcome to to come in for a comment also, our panelists, if you have a question for each other, you're also most welcome to, to pose a question to each other. Uh, Maybe, yes. I think I'll start here. Uh, so Sibel talked about resilience and I've been slightly dabbling with the concept as well. So, and I, we found sort of in India, at least when you move uh, in the policy circle, uh, uh, especially bureaucracies that are dealing with questions of climate change. Uh, there is a conceptual, uh, the problem is uh, really uh, an ability to make a distinction between, uh, let's say, disaster risk trend, uh, reduction, adaptation, and resilience. Do you think there is a need to differentiate between the three or can, uh, is resilience just the bouncing back cap capacity of a certain, let's say, a system or an infrastructure? Or does it, uh, does, is that a, probably a hindrance? Yes, okay, I'll try to answer to that. I think that's a very relevant question. And we could see in the COP26 that exactly that type of questions came out, came all the time. Um, so I would say that um, from our perspective and how we think and acknowledging that there are extremely many ways of defining resilience, uh, but from our perspective at the Stockholm Resilience Center, like I think resilience is, is not at all about bouncing back. 
it can be about persisting, but it can also be about adapting and it can be about transforming. And for me, I don't see resilience without those three components. I see them as integrated in the concept. Then I think that sort of when we are talking about like political negotiations and the climate negotiations and um, there has been like sort of almost this need of breaking it down so that it gets sort of more actionable. So that's why we talk about mitigation and adaptation or disaster risk reduction. But actually what we are talking about falls under the same frame and the same concept as I see it. So like, um, I see that resilience has these three components. It can be about persisting, but in other circumstances, you might need the flexibility to adapt. And sometimes the only way of becoming resilience is actually to transform. So I think that all the trees, all the three components sort of fall into the umbrella of resilience. I don't know if I answer your question, but. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, anyone else also want to join that conversation, you're most welcome. But first, Florian. Yeah, no, thanks everyone for, for really interesting contributions. I think I would like to ask Danashri and, and uh, Sarab. Um, I mean, you both mentioned, uh, and I, I don't know, so bear with me, I'm trying to puzzle that together. But you mentioned the, the adaptation needs, um, uh, the, the different perspectives that, that specifically the focus on development. Um, and I'm trying to think that together with, with what, what Sibel was talking about, with the sort of opportunities, right, to, to actually, you know, if you, if you read things, and this is the question that Cedric asked me, but I didn't answer, uh, on, on the peace potential, right? Isn't, what is the opportunities that you see sort of um, in, in the region of, of reframing this topic away from risk, right, towards shared opportunities you mentioned that there's shared shared vulnerability right of all the countries in the region there's a need to cooperate we know that that is really complicated and and difficult but there's also a continuous discourse around cooperation and there are examples of cooperation and in the end um, also around the indus there is some form of of cooperation um, happening despite everything. I'm curious how you see sort of uh, the combination of the adaptation needs and the, the potential that lays within there um, as, as one way of maybe reframing the agenda and getting more buy-in and, and um, yeah, I mean, do I, is there an opportunity or is there no opportunity? Thanks, Florian. If Sarob or Danashri would like to respond to that, you're welcome. And then I'll turn to Sibel. Danshri, do you want to take it first? Yeah, oh, okay. I, I was thinking that maybe you can take it first. All right. Okay. Yeah, you can take it first and then I'll go after that. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think there is quite a few possibilities. As I mean, there is... Uh, when it comes to examples, uh, so I mentioned India's partnership or at least its in relationship with its neighboring states. Uh, now, Example of China may be too extreme at this point, but there are better examples of how India has collaborated with its other neighbors, uh, especially Nepal and Bangladesh. Uh, and there we have seen some, uh, and you mentioned the Indus Water Treaty. So on a trans uh, boundary scale, uh, there, I think countries have time and again tried to develop some sort of a strategy on adaptation that's shared, uh, but it has always been, uh, it's playing second fiddle to mainstream geopolitical tensions. So we see uh, emergence of certain issues uh, becoming center, uh, you know, centerpiece of debates in India, and then they just go away uh, moment something else erupts. So I think the, the problem with finding a common sort of platform where all these countries can come together on issues of adaptation, uh, one, there is no institutional uh, uh, that's the biggest lack, multilateral institutional building. That does not, uh, that's not only except BIMSTEC. There is uh, some amount of work that is being done in one of the platforms uh, on climate. But again, economics uh, dominate in that domain as well, uh, more than the climate change. Uh, if you look at policies in India, uh, I work on the blue economy policy in India currently. And uh, if you just look at the draft policy document in India on blue economy, it talks about everything under the sun except the blue part. Uh, so the framing itself is broadly in India still in terms of uh, this balancing of development and 
uh, you know, environmental adaptation and mitigation. So I think one area where India, these countries can work together at this point, I feel is institutional building, which deals directly with the issue of climate change. That's one of the biggest lack in I feel. Um, yeah, so uh, apart from the institutions, which, you know, we have institutions we built under SARC, which don't seem to be working. Uh, BIMSTEC, again, uh, I mean, it's on and off. Uh, I wouldn't say it's really flourishing the way we expected it to work, uh, even on other issues, forget about climate change. So so I, I don't know where the regional institutions are, uh, you know, in terms of addressing these concerns. So we need to sort of strengthen them. But I, I think if we, if, uh, like Florian asked about reframing the debate, I think one way of reframing it would be to take it down from the nation state level uh, and look at transnational cooperation beyond the nation states. Uh, we are seeing cooperation, say, in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. It is happening. May not be with China because of the current geopolitical tensions or with Pakistan, but we see that, okay, with Nepal and with other countries, there is some level of cooperation which is not necessarily that something that you can fit into that, you know, state to state sort of relations, uh, community level, uh, like educational non state actors, like, you know, NGOs, educational organizations, others are already working on how to build knowledge around these issues. So this is something that can take it forward, I feel, you know, beyond all these geopolitics, which seems to be scuttling any efforts to uh, to you know uh, to build peace through say adaptation for instance uh, but you know that may not be enough still because these these kind of efforts will also be at some point scuttled by the the geopolitical tension so we have to sort of address uh, you know that the, the the tensions at that level through a top-down approach so we need both bottom-up uh, like Sundarban area I take examples of both Sundarban region and the Hindu Kush Himalaya region which are both shared, uh, re, like shared geographical like regions. Um, I think there is enough scope for it, both India and Bangladesh to work on it. So we have signed memorandum of understanding, but again, uh, it hasn't really taken, uh, it hasn't been taken forward. Uh, uh, so there are some institutions like um, EC Mode, which is looking at, uh, you know, uh, transnational efforts uh, in Himalaya region. Um, which are funded by including state agencies, but that also may not be enough to take forward all kinds of uh, uh, you know efforts like on adaptation, uh, which may also lead to some sort of peace building at a later stage. So we are still far off from that stage, but I think that there is uh, there are umpteen number of uh, 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 you know uh, initiatives through which we can take it forward. Another thing which I want to mention: all the treaties that we have, Indus Waters Treaty, Ganges Treaty, all these treaties also have um, articles which mention areas of cooperation, areas of you know. But again, those areas have been somewhere left behind. Everything else is being taken care of, but areas of cooperation have not been sufficiently exploited. So far, so again, there are there is enough scope. Uh, we have uh, uh, initiatives, we have policies, but then we are not we are not using them to our advantage. You're on mute, Cedric. Sorry, thank you so much for both those inputs. And um, I mean, two thoughts come to mind uh, for me. Uh, one is that. Um, you know, sometimes we are kind of limited by interstate relations and structures. And, and uh, when we take the climate lens and we look more at ecosystem governance, um, other opportunities also arise that I think you you highlighted very well, Ganeshri. And the other thought I had is that comparing and looking at many other, for instance, uh, you know, multilateral governance, uh, water governance system, transboundary water governance systems, um, they all seem to be you know, full of, of tension and lots of problems, but at the same time, in most cases, they have uh, managed to function without those countries resor resorting to, to violence or conflict. So there's a degree of resilience in those systems that at least creates some forum for managing those tensions short of, of violent conflict. So and I think that's the other thing I like about the resilience concept. You know, it doesn't have to be a success. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good enough to create some capacity to, to manage and allow us to, to continue without uh, lapsing into violent conflict. Okay, Sibel. Yes, sorry, I'm wondering if you wanna take uh, 
some question from the chat first. Tuan, the last time I looked, um, um, so Yoram is asking, um, how do religion, spirituality, and indigenous knowledge systems moderate climate-related conflicts? Um, and then also from Su Zhong Yu, um, she is asking if the climate crisis, if the climate crisis, um, so she's saying if the climate crisis is getting um, increasing under a condition of unstable policy and political environment, and if there's effective natural resource management. It's, for instance, in the context of uh, rule of law, um, which practices and approaches would be applied on that field? So um, those are two questions out there that uh, any panelists are, are free to respond to. But we can go first, maybe give you a chance to think about that and go first to, to uh, you, Sabelle, if you wanted to raise something else before answering some of those questions. Yes, I had uh, a question. Uh that I, I have been thinking a lot myself, and I think it has been discussed in many forums as well. But I wanted to hear perhaps from Florian or, or uh, Saurabh, uh, their opinion. Um, so like we talked here in the panel, I mean, you talked about, about um, um, the need or uh, like for instance, like Indian, Indians resistance of acknowledging uh, you know, the climate security issues at the Security Council, etc. So like, I, I would like to hear a little bit about the backside of that. So like, are there, what are the risks of acknowledging climate security um, risks um, at the, uh, or climate security issues at the sort of uh, UN Security Council, sort of what is the, because uh, I, I'm, um, I'm thinking that there are some potential risks of get, getting climate as a security question, right? So um, I would just like to, to hear a little bit from you if you have any thoughts about that. Thanks. Florian, you had your hand up earlier, but it's down again now, right? What do you want to come Yeah, in? no, that was, uh, it was just interesting, but we're, we're not talking about the region per se, but it's of course, I found it interesting that SARC is is still in some existence, right? But but it's one of the the few regional organizations in in a in a region that is highly impacted by climate um, that that is unable, you know, for many reasons unable to to put it on the on the agenda, right? Um, but but uh, maybe maybe that's also one of the regions where the geopolitical and and um, uh, regional Tensions are just uh, impossible to 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 um, manage that and compare that to to maybe other regions. Um, I I don't know. I I think I, I I would need a second to think about the the question that Sibel asked, which I think is really interesting. Um, I think also actually uh, Danashri and and um, has probably some thoughts on that. Um, at least written on that. I think. Yeah, and I think Sarah. Uh, summarized earlier is uh, three things that I took from what he said. Uh, one, uh, that there's a risk or fear that uh, one can use the enforcement action of the Security Council against certain countries on, on climate-related issues. So, for instance, you know, uh, sanctions against Brazil for um, yeah. certain aspects related to the Amazon. There's that fear that if, if one raises it to the Security Council, some of the powers of the Security Council can be used uh, in this area. And then I think the other issue which you raised is, is that the Security Council um, represents a certain set of interests, but the, the more global interests are, are perhaps better reflected in the General Assembly or the UNFCCC. So that's another, another concern that uh, raising it or pushing it via the Security Council may give certain countries more influence over the topic than, than others. Um, but if you want to expand on that, so Rob or Danashri, please. I'll just add, uh, apart from those two, I think the third thing that I wanted to highlight was uh, protectionism. Uh, that's one thing that the developing countries fear the most. Uh, that it, if this climate security linkage goes ahead, uh, this can be utilized by the uh, developed countries, particularly to raise uh, some sort of tariffs, 
there is, like I mentioned, the debate in the WTO since 1996 on uh, processes and production methods based, uh, uh, putting some sort of, uh, you know, check on how a certain product is being brought to market, the processes itself. Uh, India has an example where a US uh, banned India shrimp uh, uh, production. Uh, India shrimp production was majorly affected by the ban by the US because of how it was cultured in uh, areas where uh, turtles were uh, being uh, caught in the nets where shrimp farming was going on. And the, that basically b brought the whole question down to production methods. And India felt that uh, because almost 1% of India's GDP is dependent at this point on fisheries sector. Uh, India felt at that point that this was uh, uh, clearly uh, not something acceptable. So ne neoprotectionism is one other factor I feel uh, uh, that these countries fear uh, making that link. Uh, on the other question of religion, uh, that's an interesting question and culture. I think that's, I think it works both ways. Uh, it's a good thing and a bad thing. India has uh, a long history uh, where I come from in the part of the country uh, of sacred groves. Uh, and that has basically now, and I don't remember the article at this point, but I read this you know, a couple of years ago about how uh, communities came together. And it, it, there are countless examples in India, how communities come together to save certain resources, uh, natural resources, and by linking it to spiritual, and yet they become sort of symbols of uh, their religion, uh, whether it's uh, rivers, uh, whether it's uh, forests, uh, that uh, is one side of the story. The other side, of course, is superstition and uh, where you are catching hold of many animals in uh, the wildlife in India uh, for because you sort of, you know, link it up with the market, which is has certain beliefs in, you know, that it has some magical properties and whatnot. So religion can work both ways with the, this whole idea of uh, conservation. Uh, also, uh, in terms of culture, I think a, a very good example of, uh, in, you know, environmental peace building, you would say, uh, you can argue that India every year since 1992 uh, bans fishing on both its coasts for two months. Uh, uh, that's a, a unilateral, it was initially started as a ban on trawlers going into the uh, high seas and in the local waters as well. Uh, but the local fishermen also stopped doing it so as to give the fish time to breed in that area. Uh, what has changed eventually, and that, that's where the complexity of climate security comes in. Uh, what is happening right now is that uh, this is there is this two-month ban on, so let's take the example of the east coast of India. There's a two-month ban on fisheries uh, because of this. Then there is another uh, ban because uh, olive ridley turtles uh, will be hatching on certain in certain areas. So here, this is where nature comes in direct conflict with human interests. And you see uh, in certain parts, certain districts in the East Coast of India, the ban almost lasts seven months. Uh, then also there is the issue of number of days at sea are coming down uh, and, and the fish stock is going down because of climate change. So all these different factors are interacting with each other. Uh, aquaculture sector in India is growing at a rapid scale. Uh, it requires uh, something called small fishes that are generally just caught alongside the big catch. That was generally used as fodder. Uh, but because the scale of the sector became so huge that now you're using uh, fishes from the main food, uh, you know, uh, sec the fishes that will go into the food sectors, uh, food processing sector, uh, going into food processing and aquaculture sector as fodder. So leading to food security issues. Uh, so how these complex uh, interlinkages are linked, I think uh, both culture, culturally are, it, it, it's a relevant question uh, and uh, I think policy-wise as well. So I think that's a long winding answer to a couple of the. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Dinashi, did you want to come in on any of those? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I mean, I think Saurabh covered the, the culture, religion part really well. I just wanted to add about the role of indigenous knowledge I think it's a very important part. I think even in India, in South Asian region largely, uh, there are a lot of cases where, again, as I mentioned, if you don't look at the national government, state government, uh, you just look at the kind of uh, interactions that are happening between communities that are directly affected by climate change, who may end up you know, conflicting with each other over, uh, say, water resources or something. 
indigenous knowledge around how to conserve water, like farming communities in both Karnataka and Tamil Nadu who have known to uh, be at the opposite sides due to the conflict over Kaveri River. Uh, they seem to, you know, they seem to find platforms to talk to each other, talk about indigenous knowledge that can resolve the conflict as well. So while there is a Supreme Court case going on about, you know, how to share the water between the two states, there are other parallel kind of conversations, interactions happening among the communities who actually are affected by the water scarcity concern. So I think indigenous knowledge in, in not just water, I think forest land management, uh, our wildlife uh, conservation, and all these issues, we need to take uh, indigenous knowledge uh, into consideration. And that's very important and very often in policies, again, although indigenous knowledge tends to get mentioned, again, in real operationalization that uh, gets ignored, unfortunately, right? So that is very important. On the question of uh, uh, climate and security, uh, I think there is, there, there, there is there, there, I mean, there are risks associated with climate change uh, being linked to security, if, depending on how we look at security, right? So if we are looking at security from a national security or something like that, then obviously there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of historical baggage associated with that. But like Florian mentioned, like Saurabh mentioned, look at the human security issues. There is enough and more to study and uh, and and talk about and find solutions to. And this is where uh, I feel like the UNSC sometimes may not be able to do that, and you know may not be able to uh, uh, may not be able to address this you know the 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 local uh, sort of understanding of how these issues play out. So even if you take the example of migration uh, or displacement because of disasters, most often it's the local communities, the local governments who have who are like the first responders who have to first find out how to go about this, even before the national government, right? So I think we need to include these uh, uh, these communities more than uh, talking about it at the UNSC. That's just my opinion, though. Um, um, and 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 like sort of mentioned, there are there are risks. Uh, like in some cases, there is a risk of militarization as well. Like military becoming the solution, right? So you know, military becoming the primary solution to say addressing climate security concerns. Again, these this is something that goes with the Indian discourse. I'm not saying this happens. But there is that risk, at least in some cases, where some countries where the military seems to be a powerful player, uh, generally in governance related issues, right? Uh, so that may happen as well. And UNSC generally being this unrepresentative organization doesn't seem, you know, doesn't, doesn't appeal to many as that sort of uh, forum to discuss these issues. There's always that scare that, you know, if you discuss in the UNSC, Issues like CBDR, historical responsibility, all these other issues which are central to how the UNFCCC negotiations uh, go will not be adhered to. So, you know, there is that fear of all these different uh, principles being diluted as well, which are already being diluted, uh, you know, in various ways. So you don't want an additional sort of, you know, UNSE intervention, which may do that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Those are very interesting points. And uh, I recognize Sibel and, and Florian is going to come in as well. But just to say that um, in, in our work on this topic, especially at the Security Council, uh, the focus is on those countries that are already on the agenda of the Security Council and um, how the UN that has, a, that has given a mandate to, for instance, a peacekeeping operation or a mediation, how those missions take into account the degree to which that conflict uh, and those tensions or social issues related to that are influenced by climate change or environmental actors. So it's so most of the work is very focused on those specific countries, not on the you know large kind of debates that are also taking place at the UNFCCC and so on. And so, but it's interesting that of course those linkages are are being made, but uh, because of those concerns that you've highlighted, and it's important to take note of those. Okay, Sibel. Yes, I'll be very quick because I think that uh, uh, both Sarab and uh, uh, Danashri uh, had covered it very well. But like about um, about still about the question about religion and culture and spirituality, um, one of the things that we see in several cases is that so like sort of for instance when we think about many local communities of the world and indigenous communities, how their identity is associated with nature. And so, and exactly as Sarah very well mentioned, that has this 
those two sides. So like sometimes we see cases where, you know, local identity associated with nature makes people want to preserve certain resources. And for that, even if they are in conflict of other reasons, they come together and actually um, uh, are able to have a forum for discussing how can we collaborate to say this that is important for us and to sort of keeping those resources that are important for us. So sometimes it can it can be a way of bridging people, but other times, you know, like if we look, for instance, in the conflicts in Sahel, you know, between pastoralists and and farmers, then it's, it's exactly the opposite. It's like people's identities associated with the territory and its territory that both groups want to have, and then it, it becomes a source of conflict instead. So it's a little bit both an enabler and a barrier, uh, depending on the context. So again. So yeah, I just wanted to do this quick point. Please go ahead. Thanks, Sibella. Over to you, Florian. Yeah, no, thanks. I just wanted to wait in briefly on the Security Council thing. I think it's really interesting. And, and I think what the Pathways uh, approach is showing us, if, if you, uh, we're working on a visualization of it, but when you, when you, when you think it through, um, it, 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 it shows you all the components, right? It shows you, well, on the one hand, we have climate change as a factor here. On the second side is it's people's vulnerabilities. And the other part side is the security side. Well, if you think about that, that is different spaces and entry points for interventions or, or in responses, that's maybe the, the better term here, um, re responses to come in. Um, it shows us also one of the problems. It's, well, we need climate mitigation, we need climate adaptation, we need development, we need peace and security responses, right, in this space to navigate. There's no one response. So we, the Security Council, I think, is an important one, but it can't be the only one. It needs to be a much more holistic response um, uh, spreading through through um, different different fora, different institutions on various levels. Um, I find the, the inclusion point the security council really important and, and um, or, or the, as a non-inclusion point, I guess, um, of, of not being inclusive and, and um, as a process as being more inclusive um, in that regard is, is really interesting. Um, but I also think what, what changed over the time, and that is the, the attention I think in the council that has not per se to do with climate change, but it's more like, well, you know, the traditionalists that want to keep the council very narrow on, on very narrow security framings, um, where there's a, a push to broaden the security agenda. Now, I guess we, we probably fall into somewhere as a camp that looks, the world looks different and there are different security spaces, right? And, and it's not about, threats to peace and security are not only nuclear related essentially um, um, but that is still a tension inherently in the in the council right which which is uh, because I would say there is no really a risk for the militarization because if you think about it there isn't really other than than in the context of of peace operations where where you already deployed and um, but I don't see what a response would be um, of course, it would be interesting a reflection to hear from, from you, Sos, because I know that, that in some of the discussions I had in South Asia, um, that's a, the, in, for instance, the Sri Lankan military was reflecting like, well, actually 50% of what we do is, is disaster risk response, right? Um, also an interesting space on or question around militarization in that sense internally in the internal response um, of it that, that is worth, worth elaborating on. But I think, yeah, that is, um, I think what is important is, aside from the council, to think about spaces um, outside, think about the Peace Building Commission, for instance, and, and um, not be where, where you would have countries putting themselves forward, having ownership to put themselves forward on the agenda, right? So thinking if Somalia puts themselves on there, um, focused on climate security, and they want to discuss it, it's a different thing than if, if some Western government or, or some, some elite club decides to put countries on the, on the agenda, right? Um, I think we need more of that. We need, we need to, to find more um, uh, spaces and, and uh, come to a fairer process there overall. Yeah, thanks. 
Thank you so much, Florian. I see we only have about seven minutes left, so I would like to ask uh, the panelists if you have any uh, closing remarks, or closing thoughts that you would like to give before we bring the panel to an end. And I'll, I see, Sarab, you had your hand up, so I'll maybe I'll, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to the Nashri, and then to Florian, and then to Isabel. So starting with Sarab. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think I a uh, couple of things that I think in my own experience uh, that I have seen is one is this issue that climate change still remains uh, very difficult to explain climate change both to the bureaucrat as well as the farmer. Uh, translation of climate change uh, is a major issue. Uh, the language is, so if I go to a farmer and it's say 1.5 degrees and two degrees it's that we need a necessary, uh, we need to un, you know, make sure that this translation becomes an important aspect of climate security as well. How do you want to you know, explain it to someone? I face the same issue when I try to convey, uh, you know, because I think climate policy in India is essentially basically a layer put upon the existing bureaucracy. So it's the same people dealing with this one more issue, uh, which they keep conflating with other things. So what you end up with is uh, uh, if, the question, if I say, uh, or anybody uh, goes to a, you know, a policymaker in India says, and that by 2030s, uh, this is what uh, the projections shows. Uh, then the question really comes down to, it's broken down in the same way that it was be being broken down before as well. So question of finance becomes important. Uh, and it's very difficult to sort of translate uncertainty into policy. Uh, and that seems to be a big problem that how do you translate, uh, how do you explain uh, to, let's say, I, uh, I work in the maritime domain uh, and go to a port uh, and tell the port authorities that sea level rise is going to be a big challenge going ahead. Uh, there is such deep layers of path dependency and such levels of investments already being made into the existing setup uh, that sort of changing pathway at this point uh, for these uh, uh, particular stakeholders is a very difficult task. Uh, so that's one of the points I wanted to make. The other is- Just uh, one I more minute, because we want to give the others a chance as well, Sarah. All right, so I think I'll just uh, end it then. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Uh, Danashri? Yeah, uh, there was a great conversation uh, between all the speakers and uh, some great questions as well. Just, you know, I think I, I completely agree with Saurabh on, you know, when even when we talk about cross-disciplinary research and trying to translate that into policy, very important to look into translation, language, all these issues. Uh, and not just that, even mindsets, right? So if we are talking about co-production of knowledge, which is very uh, something that is catching up in this area a lot, uh, how are we going to co-produce knowledge where a room full of policymakers, scientists, uh, social scientists, all kinds of different disciplinary backgrounds come and sit and talk about these issues? So it's very important that we can reach a, a, a kind of a place where we can think alike on these issues. Alike as in doesn't mean that it needs to be aligned to each other, but at least in terms of where we need to head towards uh, and how are all these different uh, principles going to be integrated. The other part is I think we need to look at it in a systemic way. Uh, this was mentioned by all the all the speakers. It's very important that uh, something like COVID-19 need not be seen separate from climate change. I think these are challenges which interact with each other at multiple levels. It happened recently as well when you know two cyclones hit India uh, and Bangladesh. It also affected uh, you know uh, it also affected populations that were you know going through this COVID-19, the second wave that happened in the region. Uh, so we need to look at it uh, from a systemic perspective that is very important and where institutions, that the third point about institutions will have to start working with each other and not just, you know, as a separate layer, like climate change is a separate layer on the existing bureaucracy itself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nasri. Florian? Yeah, no, maybe catching up on that that last point. I think, I mean, there's, there's one point uh, to to pick up on everybody will come now I also need to do climate security right uh, because it doesn't fit but kind of everybody needs to do something but I think we need to come to an understanding that climate action is peace building and climate action is development and we can't separate those things uh, we need to start thinking them together and and um, which in the end I'm absolutely convinced means we're actually doing less more effectively for for less money 
right? It will be much cheaper in the response. It just needs to be integrated. But I think overall to be able to do that, um, and, and that is echoing what was both um, said before, is we need this translation. Um, and we need to, in that sense also, we need to simplify accurately and, and um, translate it into useful information, which means we also need to account for the practitioners. Sometimes we, we still have difficulties to talk to practitioners. Um, uh, you know, we, we sitting comfortably here in, in, in Uppsala and, 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 and give great advice how you should, should run business in Mali, right? Um, it's complicated. It's complicated in circumstances. We need to have pay more attention to that. What are the limiting factors for uh, in these contexts and uh, find a supportive way of, of um, working together on on translating these these uh, uh, our knowledge into a way that that the practitioner can pick up and and add its own thinking on Excellent. that. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much, Florian. Then Sibel. Um, yes. So, like, just building on the other two panelists' last points, I do believe that we are entering the area where co-production of knowledge and interdisciplinary collaborations will need to become mainstream. So that's that's exactly what you were talking about. And I guess that for that, with all the challenges that it takes, you know, we need to take sort of time in learning the same language, and we need to acknowledge pluralism. So like recognizing that there are multiple ways of knowing and multiple ways of doing, there's no right or wrong way. And then I guess that to facilitate that, we also need to, to be better into sort of establishing like joint grounds, like, you know, agree on a context and joint goals, because that kind of helps those processes to not to become so fuzzy and everywhere and become a bit more sort of concrete and keeping those interactive. And then lastly, I would just like to say that, you know, uh, at the local level is where these sort of linkages between conflict and climate are many times more visible. So I think it is very important to keep learning with what is actually happening on the ground and to sort of see where are there positive examples that we can potentially scale up or replicate or learn with, you know, like not necessarily replicate the same things, but also keeping this this idea, because I think that sometimes it's one thing or the other, but actually, you know, as we know, like everything is embedded across scales. So like keeping this idea that nothing is isolated and that we are actually need this multi-scale uh, actions if we are up to navigate these complex questions. Thank you very much for the discussion. Thank, thank you so much, Sibel, and, and the rest of the panel and, and all of you who've joined us for this discussion. I, I hope we have already through this uh, past hour and a half started part of a cross-disciplinary discussion and a dialogue uh, and also, you know, uh, a global uh, engagement with us from coming to these issues from different, different regions of the world and different perspectives. So thank you so much for all of you for investing your time together in working on these issues and we look forward to continue it in future. So thank you so much. Have a nice day.